Mint 19.3 with Cinnamon was released on December 18th, 2019, so a little under a month ago as of this video. For the installer, Mint defaults to a live session rather than a dedicated installer session, and being based on Ubuntu 18.4 LTS, it uses the same Ubiquity installer that Ubuntu uses. Mint uses a pretty straightforward partition setup consisting of a single partition for the root and home partitions and an ESP partition for the UEFI stuff. Basically everything about the installer is pretty run of the mill. You set your time zone here, you create your user here, it's nothing special. After the install and initial login, we're greeted with a pretty darn comprehensive welcome screen that covers pretty much everything important about the distro. It recommends system snapshots, drivers, updates, as well as showing how to change the desktop layout and some other stuff like that. There's also links to the documentation, help forms, and places to contribute to the project. Next, after the welcome screen, we'll look at the post-install pre-update disk usage. Since Mint set up a single partition to house everything, we can look at slash dev slash SDA2 and see that a fresh Mint install with Cinnamon is just about 7.8 gigabytes. Not bad. Next, we'll bust out HTOP to check out system usage resources. HTOP wasn't actually installed by default, so I had to install it from the default repos. Mint was using just under 650 megabytes of RAM at idle, as well as 99 tasks with only one of them running at a time. It looked like the Cinnamon session itself was consuming the most memory, which really wasn't too much, and most of the CPU activity was coming from HTOP itself. Now the flavor of Mint I'm using here is the flagship flavor with the Cinnamon Desktop version 4.4.5. Cinnamon, being a fully fledged desktop environment in its own right, comes mostly with its own apps, but some other apps from other projects such as GNOME, like the GNOME Archive Manager and LibreOffice are included. As with any good Linux desktop distro, there's an app for pretty much everything you do day to day. The list of default apps that Mint ships with is actually quite comprehensive. I can't possibly feature all of them in this video. Mint's profile and bash RC files contain quite a lot of helpful stuff to make life in the terminal a bit easier, though I'm pretty sure most, if not all of this, is carryover from Ubuntu. Mint is also home to some incredible wallpapers, possibly the most and best wallpapers I've ever seen in a Linux desktop distro. Not only are there a ton of them, they're all great quality and high resolution. It's pretty sweet. Now slightly confusing is how Mint handles updates. There's the regular Mint software manager, but the actual updates for software are handled in a separate app called Update Manager. Update Manager has a bunch of really helpful tools though, such as a PPA manager, a mirror changer, and uh, some other stuff. Unfortunately, I had some issues switching mirrors in that most of the mirrors didn't actually work. I eventually found one or two that worked, but most of them didn't seem to work at all, despite the little list here saying that they would. It was kind of a weird problem to have. Hardware drivers are handled in a separate app too, though if you were crazy, you could install them via the software manager. The latest recommended driver from NVIDIA is NVIDIA driver 435, which is not the latest driver available from NVIDIA as of today. I believe that this driver manager tool is another carryover from Ubuntu and you can configure a PPA to easily install the very latest NVIDIA drivers very easily the same way you would on Ubuntu. After the NVIDIA drivers are installed, we'll go ahead and reboot, log in, and check the system boot time using system deanalyze. The absolute startup time is just over 20 seconds from the bootloader, which is pretty damn good for a regular hard disk drive. And while we're in the terminal, let's take a look at NeoFetch. Now, as you can see, this is Linux Mint 19.3 Trisha running kernel version five. We've got just over 2000 packages installed. The desktop environment is Cinnamon using Mutter with the Mint Y dark theme, basically just your standard Linux Mint install with Cinnamon. Now let's take a look at how well Mint supports non-repo apps. These two app images I have took a couple seconds to start up. It was noticeable, but they ended up launching okay besides the startup time. Flat packs like this flat ref here worked right out of the box and FlatHub is enabled from the software manager without any extra configuration. They take forever to install though. Snaps are not supported, but you can install the snap daemon from the default repos. Next, let's have a look at codec support. Traditionally, this has been a major issue on some Linux distros, but it's much less of an issue today. The only codec that Mint struggled with was one that used FFV1, it was an MKV file, and it was super choppy. 
I'm unsure what caused it on this machine, but I can confirm that the playback on my main workstation was fine, so I don't know. Likewise, all of the audio files played just fine, but most of them played with the video player rather than the media player like Rhythmbox. Next, we'll install an assortment of regular applications from the application manager. I'm pleased to see that I'm able to find development libs and tools such as Docker and Wine from here. I find it super annoying when an application manager only shows a subset of what is actually available in the repos. I don't know why they do that. I was able to find everything in my list of apps, which is quite comprehensive, and I posted in the description a list of all of the apps I was looking for. I also sourced a couple of third-party apps, TeamViewer and Zoom Meeting, both which had their own dev files and installed just fine. Now let's talk about local and remote shares. My external SSD mounted automatically with no questions asked. I'm not sure if I like that though, because auto mounting devices like that can have unintended side effects, but the whole process is automagic and that's pretty cool. Samba was not installed or configured by default, but it's really easy to do with the built-in tools, which again, I think come from Ubuntu. However, after Samba was installed, neither my Linux workstation nor my Windows laptop were automatically discovered on the network, which is a bummer. I was able to access my Windows laptop directly through Samba, which was cool. I was also able to access the Linux workstation via SSH without any issues either. And finally, my printer was detected and installed automatically. There's not really much to say about this whole section because it was practically seamless and I didn't really have any issues to speak of, so that's a good thing. Now something I want to start doing with each episode is covering live streaming and recording because I've actually had some issues on certain distros struggling with streaming and encoding codecs, things like that. Now I stream on Mixer from time to time, so we'll point OBS here at Mixer and have it run its little test stream thing. We're going to be doing a quick test stream of our own here using Mixer's FTL and Invenc, which is what OBS chose, and everything seemed to work just fine. I didn't change the name of the stream though, so if you go over to Mixer, it's probably going to be called like Overwatch AI something something. Now I've got my PS4 controller here and we're going to try setting it up with Bluetooth, which always seems to be a bit of a struggle. First the controller said it was connected, but the Bluetooth manager said it didn't. Then it was the other way around. After some fiddling, I was able to connect the damn thing and use the little mouse pad on the controller. Unfortunately, Steam did not want to recognize the controller no matter what I did. This seems to have caused like really bad issues in driving games like Dirt here where the controls were just a mess. The graphics defaulted to the lowest possible, which is fine, but everything just totally looks like butt. The control sticks had really bizarre dead zones, which made the car handle just, it was terrible. I was able to turn the graphics up on medium and still have it be playable, but I never figured out the controller issue. Now incredibly, I managed to play a full round of Overwatch using the default settings it chose, which was like a low medium hybrid at 1080p. I averaged probably 30 to 35 frames a second with some brief stuttering here and there. It wasn't really barely noticeable. Now obviously Overwatch isn't a Linux game. I'm running this through Lutris via Wine 420 using DXVK, and as you can see, this is more than playable. Next, I wanted to try out a native Linux game from the repos, and Sourbrotten was one of the first Linux first-person shooters I played way back in the day. And to be honest, this game has not aged well, like, at all. I recorded it right after that Overwatch match, so eh. The performance was just fine, though, and honestly, the game has a ton of content for being a mostly forgotten, totally free and open source game found in pretty much all standard repos across, you know, Linux distros and stuff. Now, the last thing we're going to be looking at is the Geekbench benchmarks. Since this is the first distro we're looking at in the series, we'll compare it against Ubuntu 18.4 from last season. Now, check this out. Despite using the same kernel version, Linux Mint beat Ubuntu 18.4 in every single test listed, doing the best in the multi-core performance section. Now I have no clue why Mint did so much better over Ubuntu 18.4, considering Mint is literally based on 18.4. Arguably the biggest difference between the two is that Mint is running Cinnamon and Ubuntu is running GNOME. The Ubuntu benchmark was run on September 13th of 2019, so maybe there have been like huge performance enhancing updates or something, but I can't confirm that. And with that, we've reached the end of this episode. I do hope that you enjoyed it, and if you did, be sure to leave a like, comment, subscribe. If you're into the gaming stuff I do, I have another channel where I upload said gaming stuff, and I'm also on Mixer where I live stream occasionally. If you want to get in touch with me, you can follow me over on Twitter, Patreon, or Coffee, and of course you can support me over there too. 
And if you like what I do, you can directly support me by checking out the affiliate links in the description. They go a long way. I appreciate all of your support, and thanks for watching.